happy that uh, that um, Stefan Prestel actually mentioned some of the soft modeling that goes on in, in the event generators. Uh, so it makes my life a bit easier. So I'm going to start out with with uh, discussing kind of the, the inclusive cross sections in PP. Uh, talk about minimum bias and some Reggie theory, uh, multiple interactions. Stefan Preston has already mentioned. But I'll, I'll mention some more, and then talk about the underlying events, and then. It, before I start with the heavy ions, I'm actually going to try to summarize uh, the general purpose event generators just to talk a little broadly about how, how they work and, and, and what their benefits are and, and so on. But uh, first, we're going to talk about cross sections. What happens at the LHC? So, of course, we were looking for the Higgs and we found it. And the uh, cross section is quite small 30 picobonds or something like that. And that should be compared to the total PP cross section, which is nine orders of magnitudes larger or even more. Um, of course, we have other slightly higher cross sections that many people are interested in, soft. Uh, w said, and on the soft side, we also have uh, a number of semi-inclusive uh, cross sections, non-diffractive, elastic, diffractive, and then of course we have jets, which are numerous at the LHC. Uh, and one of the issues we have when we go to QCD at smaller scales is that if we look at the cross section, the naive cross sections for jets, say above 4 GV, they, that cross section typically exceeds the total cross section. That's kind of the basis of, of many uh, multiple interaction uh, models that we have out there. And then, of course, Many people are looking for BSM, and uh, maybe they have a cross-section. But this is kind of the range of processes we're actually observing at the LHC. And as you see, basically everything, every single collision, except for a few, is actually pure QCD. So that's why we're so interested in the QCD to understand it properly. The cross section looks like this. It uh, increases logarithmically uh, with uh, increasing energy. Uh, we see that the total cross section uh, is much larger than the elastic cross section, of course. And then there are some other cross sections as well. But we're going to look at, at the typical PP collision. And, uh, uh, probably the most common, shall we say, platonic process is uh, the simple glue glue goes to glue glue sketch. Uh, this, of course, we have learned you need to add on initial state radiation and final state radiation. I'm mainly going to worry about the initial state radiation here. Now, long time ago, uh, well, not not a long time ago. I was just going to say that any such cross section is related to the elastic scattering via the optical field. You basically have a bracket and a bra state and a cat state, uh, and you put them together. Uh, so the amplitude for elastic scattering. It's related to the cross section of what we call non diffractive scattering. We'll come back to that later on. Now, in the 60s, we didn't know about partons. Uh, and uh, instead, there was a 
theory called Regi theory, where you describe elastic scattering of, of hadrons in terms of the exchange of a particle uh, that could either be a, a meson or to explain the actual rise of the cross section, you needed a hypothetical particle called a pomeron. And that turns out to be a fairly useful concept. So the elastic scattering amplitude can be described in terms of the exchange of uh, pomeron. Uh, and what we say when we have a diffractive, non-diffractive event like this, is that we cut the pomeron. If you think the pomeron as some kind of a bound, semi-bound state between two gluons, which interact by exchanging gluons. Uh, if we cut it down here, we get a, a non-diffractive event, low PT non-diffractive event. So even though this was uh, the theory of scattering in, in the 50s and 60s before we knew about partons and gluons, uh, it's actually still quite useful when it comes to very soft interaction. Now, if you can exchange one pomeron, you can exchange several, and you can write down the uh, diagram, and you can place the cut basically wherever you want. So here we have a non diffractive event. It's a cut pomeron. Here is two pomeron exchange, but only one is cut. That corresponds to a virtual correction to the non diffractive cross section. But we can also cut many pomerons. And this is, would then be what we, in our event generators, call multi particle interaction. We have more than one fairly soft glue glue interaction in each of you may ask, where are the quarks? Yeah, uh, the quarks are always there, but uh, at high energy, like at the LAC, and in general, you don't have to worry about quarks. They are only a small correction to the, the main processes, which are always dominant. And also, if you have these two here, uh, and you cut in the middle, then what happens is that you don't get any color transfer between the, 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 um, the proton. Every time we cut the gluon, the pomeron, that means we have color exchange between uh, the beams. This one has no color exchange. We have the same things coming out as we have coming in. So this is an elastic scattering. Now, in the beginning, in the, in, in the uh, uh, when, when we started with string, and string fragmentation, you could easily identify that a cut pomeron will actually correspond to a string in the final state. We have color exchange, so there is color in, in one direction and in the other direction, and, and that will give string, will fragment. So, important is to understand that every time we have a cut pomeron, we get particles produced basically flat in rapidity. You can think about this as kind of rapidity axis. And, uh, this is the beam, and this is the other beam, and between we will get a fairly uniform distribution of hadrons. Produce. Now, pomeron, just like uh, gluons, can uh, interact with themselves, self coupling. So we can have what we call a triple glue, tri triple pomeron vertex. And you can have situations like this three pomerons meeting in the vertex here. You cut it between these two legs and along this one. 
This way means we have a, a color exchange, but not in the whole rapidity. That it doesn't the color exchange does not reach the the other beams, and that means in our detector we will see a fairly uniform hadron uh, multiplicity in this region and nothing here in our detector. This is what we call a single diffracted excitation. And you can do many of these, many variants of these. You can have central diffraction like this, where we have a flat uh, hadron distribution in mid rapidity, but nothing in the forward and backward. And the other way around, you can draw diagrams like this, where you have a flat distribution in the forward and backward, but basically empty in the middle. And of course, you can make arbitrarily complicated diagrams uh, with Pomeran exchanges. And for each diagram, you can cut it basically any way you like. Uh, and, and in regi theory, there's a, not simple, but there are, uh, are tools for how to calculate the cross section for each. So there are some uh, soft multiple interaction models that do this. Uh, the original program that did this was FOJET, uh, which does these drawing of, of arbitrary uh, Pomeron diagrams, uh, weighting them according to the rules you find in theory, and cutting them and for each cut, they produce a loon string that produce particles. Uh, so what happens is that when you cut a pomeron, you can go back and say that, well, all the partons here do not need to be extremely soft. That can have a semi-hard glue glue scattering in there. So even Fojet has some initial state and final state radiation with partons before the uh, strings are drawn and, and, and uh, hadronized. SHRIMPS is another program that belongs to Sherpa done by uh, Corina Sat. Uh, similar and also EPOS LHC uh, also has similar, similar uh, models. And all of them have mini jets. Uh, as I said, you can have harder processes in these cut pomerons. Uh, so, Stefan talked a bit about multi particle scattering, and it is related to multi pomeron exchange, of course. Uh, I'm just going to go through bits about how that happens in Pythia, which was the kind of original multi parton interaction model from, from the 80s. Uh, the starting point here is the 2 to 2 QCD cross section, which we know, especially for the glue glue goes glue glue, which is the, the largest of these cross sections. It diverges like alpha squared divided by KT to the fourth. Uh, that means that if you do this integral from some cut in KT, uh, you will get a very large cross section. And uh, if you look at the total non diffracted KT cross section, it exceeds the total cross section at the LHC for KT cut around 5 GV. And the interpretation of this is, of course, that, well, having probabilities larger than one in this case, in some sense, means that we have more than one scattering in each event. So there's more than one photonic cross-section in each event. And we can simply write down the average number of hard scattering above some KT is this integral from 
uh, KT cut divided by the total non diffractive cross section. So that's the main point here. So that, that's behind all multi-particle multi scattering models. In Pythia, it takes it a bit first. Pythia says that, well, everything can be treated as if it was perturbative. What we need to do is to regularize things for low KT. KT. So Pythia has a, a regularization scale called KT0. So to make the the cross section finite, even for very small KT, you just introduce this soft turnoff, which you need to introduce also in the alpha S to avoid the lambda pole. This KT squared is, is motivated by color screening saturation, which I will come back to a bit later. And you can also say that the uh, that this color screening should depend on the center of mass energy for, for the collision. And you can say, get a, a feeling for approximately how this should behave uh, by looking at the rate of the total cross section that we looked at in the beginning. So, the uh, non-diffractive total cross-section that you need to figure out how many uh, scatterings you should have uh, is taken from parameterization. That's basically how you measure. And as I think uh, Stefan Treffel said, we then order them in KT, just as we order emissions in the part of shower in KT, which means you always pick the hardest scattering uh, by using uh, the Sudakov-like uh, form factor. And, and the way it, it happens is that you pick an impact parameter uh, from an overlap function, and you generate additional scattering with uh, KT uh, using this uh, impact parameter. So uh, I should be clear. Uh, I was not clear there. So this is the first scattering. So we decide on the first scattering using just uh, the normal uh, cross section formula. After that, we decide on an overlap of the two protons. The higher PT we have, you can say the more of the protons are overlapping in collision. For very small KT, we have them less overlap. Uh, so we need to uh, have a model for, for this overlap function uh, to, to generate uh, an impact parameter to say how far were the protons from each other when they collide. Now, we don't know exactly what this looks like. Uh, uh, the simplest answer is just to have a Gaussian massive distribution in, in, in the proton. Uh, it turns out it needs to be a bit more pointy than a simple Gaussian. So a long time, uh, I used a double Gaussian. Uh, what it uses now is actually an X-dependent Gaussian uh, that looks like this. So this is how in Pythia you look at the matter distribution, protonic distribution in the impact parameter in, in the process. And we note that in general, if you have higher KT, that means you have higher X and higher X is a, a more narrow overlap distribution, which is what nature seems to uh, prefer. But before I go on, I, I just want to make some 
notes about the summation because we have very low KTs in in, uh, in these multiple scattering, even goes down to zero. Uh, and there are many scales in a given event. Right? You have the total center of mass energy. You have the invariant mass of, of the hard system. You have the transfer T, energy momentum transfer T hat, which is around KT of, of the hardest scattering. And we have lambda QCD, which is the lowest scale uh, we have available, basically. But we also have things like mass of the W, Higgs, uh, top, whatever. And it's important to remember that every time you have two widely separated scales, there may be large logarithms due to the large phase space of, of the gluon uh, radiation that needs to be resumed. So if we have a KT, which is much larger than lambda QCD, that means we need to resum things. And that's where we get d glass evolution. But if we have very low KT, you will have scales, it's very much smaller than, than the total invariant mass of, of, of the proton proton system. We have very small X, and that will also give you logarithms that need to be resumed. So logarithms of log one over X. Of the and there are other things that uh, you need to think about sometimes. And I mentioned that in, in one of the recitations like this week for one group, that if you have moderately high KT and you have very large rapidity separation between two jets, then you will have a large S hat. And that gives you, again, scales of KT squared over S hat, that may need to be resumed if you're doing a calculation for SKL uh, situation. So the problem is now, is it reasonable to use collinear factorization even for very small KT? Well, naively you would say no. Uh, So, and, and for, as I said, for very small x, uh, there are logarithms of one, of one over x that needs to be uh, resumed. Uh, what happens in Pythia is that we say, use these uh, regularizations and the shape of the overlap function to model this uh, in a way and also model this saturation. Saturation basically means uh, that there are for very small experts, so many gluons produced that they tend to overlap in impact parameter and that means they can recombine it. So one of the exercises I want you to think about uh, for the recitation tonight is, can you draw a Pomeron diagram, cut Pomeron diagram that corresponds to a, a gluon recombination, a saturation diagram? Well, let's see. Now, I'm going to talk a bit about momentum conservation. Talk a bit about energy momentum conservation. Uh, I assume that someone has talked about the energy momentum conservation. Uh, at least I, I hope that that uh, uh, Stefan Prestel talked about it. Uh, energy momentum conservation is one of the more important things you have as a tool when you design event generation. We use it to make sure that everything is okay. If you run any 
program, uh, you will every now and then see that there is an error message saying that NG momentum was not conserved or not quite conserved. And it's a check we, we use for, for everything we do, it's a basic sanity check that we're doing the right thing. Uh, so energy momentum conservation is important and also in multiple interactions, it is of course important because every part and part of interaction will steal some energy from the, from the beam. And what you could do is continue generating these multiple interactions with decreasing KT until we run out of energy. Uh, in Pythia, it's a bit more complicated like, than that. So in Pythia, you actually rescale the PDF that is left after each multiple interaction. And that also takes care of, of the flavors in the protons that may be taken out in part and part of interaction. And here we note in particular that also initial state radiation will take momentum out of the proton. So this means we have to think about a lot about what goes first. Uh, you could think about uh, first generating all multiple interactions and then generate an initial state shower after each. And then you may ask yourself, even if there's no formal factorization theorem here, but is it reasonable to look that a low KT multiple interaction takes so much energy from the proton so that a high KT shower uh, cannot uh, evolve enough. So that is why in Pythia, you have this thing called interleaved showers. That means after the primary scattering, we have several different processes that can happen, and we let them compete just as we let different processes within a partner shower compete. So a gluon in a partner shower can emit another gluon, or it can fit into a QP bar. And the way to do it is to say, yeah, what, what happened first? And that's what we do here as well. So we have these different things. Uh, there is also a thing called rescattering of final state partons, which is actually not so important and is switched off in Pythia by default. Uh, but final state, initial state, and another multi-party interaction can always happen. And you take the one that comes first. A probability of A times the probability that nothing happens before. Another thing which is interesting that you need to worry about when, when you have these multiple interactions is how these uh, partons that are produced are connected to each other. Color connections is, of course, very important. It steers the hydronization completely. And uh, we need to understand how particles are connected. So this is the cartoon where we have uh, the first multiple scattering is the glue glue. And you can imagine there be color strings stretched from the proton remnants to one of the gluons, and then here to the other proton, and one here. And when we then add a multiple interaction, the blue one, the question is, should this stretch out color all the way out to the proton? Or maybe their colors will actually combine in another way. You can have things like this. Now, it turns out that we need to have a lot of these, what we call color connections, to avoid having too many strings 
stretching all the way up down uh, to the proto remnant. Uh, and, and this is something which is very important if you want to describe things. So here's another way of, of looking at it. You have the red hardest gluon gluon scattering. Uh, should we take the next part, next to hardest, the black one, should it be a gluon going all the way here? Or is it somehow connected here? Or here? And if you think about these cut comorons, it means that uh, uh, either we every every additional multiple interaction will add hadrons in in the forward and backward region or not. So that's a big problem we want to understand. That actually uh, is best illustrated in, in this plot. This is minimum bias, uh, where we look at the number of charged particles in your detector. Uh, this is Atlas, so it's between minus 2.5 and 2.5 and pseudo rapidity. And you look at all the charged particles and measure their average PT for a given spin in, in multiplicity. And what you see is this typical thing that the, in the beginning, the average PT increases, but then it flattens off if you look at the data here. And to get this right, it's clear that you have to have something uh, like, um, uh, these color reconnections. Um, I think if you look at the Herwig curve here, that also has color reconnections. But I think the uh, Sherpa curve here has something else. I'm, I'm not sure uh, this, this exact thing, but it's very important to, to understand the general minimum bias. So we have these multiple scatterings and we have to think about what happens if we kick out too much, then we, we will run out of energy, as I said before. But we could also think about having kicked out two valence quarks from the same proton. How do you treat that? Uh, so normally you would Right. Uh, I, uh, actually, this was not so important. So if, if you missed something I said, it, it's uh, uh, less important here. So I'm instead going to talk, talk about what the underlying event is. So this is an important thing in hard physics. Uh, when you have jets, you know that there is a kind of a jet pedestal. There is an underlying event uh, that actually 
throws in a lot of transverse energy in your jet car. And uh, you can define an underlying event in, in many different ways. Uh, here is a, a kind of cartoon of uh, a W plus jet uh, collision, this red thing here. Uh, and you can ask yourself, uh, what is the underlying event when you're trying to look at this, uh, this jet recoiling against W? And, and, and of course, you can, can say, well, we can take everything except for the half star process. We can take uh, anything except for the half star some process and the initial and final state radiation that's connected to it, that's also reasonable. Uh, but uh, normally we don't go any further. So basically uh, everything you can generate with hard matrix elements and the part and shower is something we think we have well under control. So therefore we say that the underlying event is everything else. And that means everything else is uh, multi-parting part and interaction. Uh, it's not the same as uh, a minimum bias event. That was the first way we, it was tried to be modeled, is that you take your jet and then you take uh, a normal under, uh, normal minimum bias event and you subtract the general level of, of things from there. Uh, but it's, it's interesting to see uh, what happens to a jet with everything else uh, is added on. It's clear that initial state radiation typically increases the uh, PT of a jet, uh, while final state radiation tends to remove you can have radiations, final state radiations that goes outside the, the jet cone, so that removes energy. You have the underlying event that adds energy, but you also have hadronization that tends to reduce the energy event. Now, it turns out that you can have things that, that cancel out each other by just adjusting the size of your jet cones to get as, uh, as unsensitive as possible to the underlying event. And that is what, what is usually done. However, it's of course very important that we still understand how the underlying event affects things. And, and it's important to understand that, that the, if you have harder processes, gives a bias to larger overlap, smaller impact parameter, giving more underlying events in terms of multiple scatterings or otherwise. And also that the underlying event fluctuates. It's not always that we can just subtract the number, especially if we're looking at a, a jet spectrum. The jet spectrum is steeply formed. So adding things, can actually increase or lower uh, your cross-section quite a bit. So we have to be aware of, of what's going on. Uh, another thing is, is, is for pileup. Now, the experiment has many ways of, of removing effects of pileup uh, for charge uh, hadrons, uh, they can look at vertices, but if you're looking in, in calorimeter uh, using that for your jet, then uh, it's not so easy to separate pileup uh, scattering, pileup collision. Uh, so there you again need to be, need to understand the minimal bias uh, processes to make sure you know what you're measuring. And, and measuring these 
things it's it's uh, a bit of an industry uh, how do you measure your underlying events uh, it's, if you have a typical two jet event a jet going that way and that way well you can say that well maybe if we look in this transverse direction that should mainly be dominated by uh, the underlying event uh, and that's what you typically do to understand what's going on um, and this is uh, Rick Fields who, who did a lot of these measurements looking at the uh, uh, the activity in, in these regions uh, as a function of the PT of the jet and you see uh, the general level of average PT uh, as a function of the PT of the jet uh, in, in these uh, so-called transverse regions. Now, all these non-perturbative things uh, have a lot of parameters. So just from what we've seen today, we have uh, the soft regularization PT0 parameter in this year, for instance, the overlap function had parameters. You need to parameterize some cross sections. Uh, you have color reconnection parameters. There is things like uh, intrinsic transfer momenta of, of the incoming protons. And you have choices of PDS, which are not trivial when it comes to multiparticle interaction. Uh, because uh, PDF may vary quite a bit for low scales. Uh, for larger scales, they typically agree because that's where they have been measured. But when you extrapolate at Incipia down to almost zero PT, uh, they can vary quite a bit. So there's a lot of things to, to take into account uh, to do the tune. Um, what we need in general for all these general purpose generation generators is that they should basically describe everything. Uh, and they should never be tuned to a single observable. You can always tune to a single observable. But since there are several parameters, we need to use as many observables as possible to get, to, to constrain our tune in a reasonable way. And there are st several strategies for doing this. The more, most usual one is to say that, well, the hadronization parameters uh, and the final state showers, those we can look at very specifically at, at, at E plus E minus solutions, such as LEP, where we have a lot of re really nice data. So we can fix our tune so that we tune the initial, uh, the, sorry, the final state radiation and the hadronization at LEP. And then we go to PP, where we tune uh, our multiparticle interaction model to minimum bias data. And we then can use these tunes as an underlying event model when we look at, at, uh, at, at jets in general. And, and this is what we do. Uh, there are still many ways of doing it, and there's no perfect way. But it's important to remember that everything has parameters that have been tuned. Basically, every parameter has a physical meaning, but it's not always that physical meaning gives you a value of that, a, per, um, a priori value for that uh, parameter. Typically, you can say, say that, well, this parameter that controls um, the rise of, of the cross section should basically be, so, sorry, so, uh, gives the energy dependence of this soft cutoff in Pythia. Uh, you can say that it should be related to the total cross section. So we could say that it is. But we rather say that, well, it's related to, so there could be something, so we have a parameter there instead. 
Um, but it's not always clear that we can do this. And there's one problem uh, with just universality, with what we call it, this, which is basically saying that we can tune final state interactions, final state showers and harmonization to E plus or minus, is that it's not always true. One thing is that at LEP, we mainly have very hard quark jets and gluon jets are softer and not well measured. While at the LHC, we have a very hard gluon jet. And this jet universality needs to be checked. And if you look in nitty gritty de details, you find that it, it's not true. Uh, you typically find that strange hadron production is much larger in TT than you would expect from the plus or minus. And the same thing for baryon production. So this is K over pi ratios, and this is lambda over K ratios. They're both strange, and baryonic production is, is enhanced in TP collision. And this we need to understand, and, and we don't really so far. So now we have, I'm just going to wrap up this general purpose event generators, uh, what we have. Uh, there are only three programs that we consider to be general purpose. That means they basically can generate any process. Uh, and uh, that means they have included both a way to generate hard sub-processes, part and shower, multiple interactions, harmonizations and decay. They can go from scratch and generate a complete event, at basically any collider. Uh, there are many more event generators who concern themselves only with a part of this, and uh, I've listed some of them here. Uh, but you have these three, which is Pythia, Sherpa, and, and Herwig, which you looked at. In, in the first tutorial, uh, and what should you use? Well, the general idea is that you should use uh, all three, uh, or at least two, to understand the uncertainties involved. So to compare these programs, there are some things you, you, you could think about. I mean, the Pythia uh, does not have many, uh, well, it has many, but uh, kind of the simple matrix elements, usually only two to two. It has a uh, DGLAP based part and shower. Uh, it has a, a multi-leg next to leading order merging and matching. Uh, and multiple interactions with interleaved showers. And then lip string fragmentation and particle decay. I think what stands out in Pythia is that it really is the program that is most concerned about reproducing underlying events in the minimum bias. Uh, soft physics is important for the Pythia authors. Uh, that does not mean that the hard facility physics is, is neglected, but it's this is the real strong point of Pythia. Herwig has better focus on, on hard physics, uh, but it also has uh, multiple interactions, slightly different model from what is in Pythia, uh, uh, but it has more options when it comes to uh, matching and merging. It has two different Hot and showers, which you can compare to each other. And of course, it has a completely different way of doing harmonization with the cluster harmonization. And then we have Sherpa, which is started out as a matrix element generator, so it does the hard part very well. Uh, it's slightly less uh, focused on, on softer physics. Uh, but it, it does have some uh, interesting ways of that. 
And then, of course, we have related tools uh, that are used together with these generators. Uh, so the matrix element generation where MadGraph is the most used one, I think. And we also need to think about the PDF parameterization. And of course, we have rivets. Uh, this afternoon, you will be, uh, uh, some of you will be working with rivets. I, I will not discuss it very much more. And we have another nice tool to compare the different generators. So I showed you a plot from this before. This is called MC plot, the standard CH, uh, where all the general purpose event generators and some more are compared to each other for different kinds of observables. There's a huge amount of observables that you can look at to understand if I'm interested in this process, which generators are best on this describing data, uh, or which differs most, which gives you a feeling for how well these processes are understood. Okay, so tomorrow I will talk about heavy ions. And I'm just gonna get, give a quick rundown what heavy ions Heavy ion collisions is and, and uh, uh, why they are not typically available in the general purpose event generators. Because even though, I mean, when I first started working with heavy ions, it was, I, I, there was things that popped into my head. I mean, it shouldn't be that different from PP, right? This is just smashing bunches of nucleons together. But then there, there are people speak in a different language sometimes. There's many talk about Glauber calculations. You know, what is a Glauber calculation? And, and, and yeah, Glauber is Roy Glauber, uh, Nobel laureate. But what, what's he got to do with uh, heavy ions? And then they talk about centrality. And you realize that that is related to this impact parameter. And I can understand if you have big, heavy ion colliding, uh, the impact parameter can be fairly central in, in how to understand the collision. And then there is so many particle producers. In each collision, there are thousands of particles produced. And this means that people who do calculations usually resort to uh, statistical methods like, like hydrodynamics and stuff to describe what's going on in heavy ions. Uh, but the other hand, uh, thousands of particles isn't that many. And how do they get from what they call quark gluon plasma to hadrons? Uh, so I'm from Lund. I, I understand the hadron production in terms of string fragmentation. Why can't I use that? And then what are they actually measuring? is something that comes up. Uh, and that is some of this I'm gonna talk about tomorrow. So the main idea with heavy ion collision is to explore the QCD phase diagram. So if you have uh, a diagram where you have temperature here and density or barium density here, we normally live down here low temperature, low barium density. But if we go up and up in density, somewhere you will cross over and get a neutron star-like medium. And if you go up here, you start to have high temperatures, like in LHC or the relativistic heavy ion collider rig. And somewhere they believe that you come into a place where hadrons are no longer the correct degrees of freedom, but quark gluon plasma. And it's this quark gluon plasma they want to study. And the idea is that this should be accessible at high temperatures here. And this is what a heavy ion collision looks like. It's a lead-lead collision. And as you can see, there are indeed thousands of particles. Let me say how many this is. I guess 
two, three times. And then what they measure is often a bit odd. They don't measure, well, they do measure jet miles and like that, but they measure something they call flow. So the idea is that if two heavy ions uh, don't hit each other head on, but they kind of uh, glance each other like this, the collision system that is left when the rest of the ions race along the beam height right, is highly asymmetric and kind of almond form. And if you treat this with hydrodynamics, you will find that the forces in the transverse direction here will be larger than in this. So you, you expect to find an asymmetry in phi in the general production of, of particles, uh, which would look something like this. So if it's very high uh, centrality, low impact parameter, it is not so asymmetric, and then you get like this, which is this phi correlation. But if it's uh, glancing uh, peripheral scattering, you will get a large asymmetry. And that is very important in heavy ion collision. Another thing is called jet quenching. You can imagine uh, if you have a jet going out, this produced here in, in kind of outskirts of the interaction. One jet goes here. The other one needs to go through all this mess, which is the rest of the collision. And the idea is that that jet will become quenched. Uh, and this is an example of an event where you think that there is some jet quenching. Uh, you have a very small jet here balancing a hard jet. And then they measure things like RAA. And that is, is a tricky thing, because this is where you measure something in, in, a, in heavy ion collisions, and then you compare to a number of proton-proton collisions. So you have your here. And, but to get that number, they do this Glauber calculation to estimate how many proton collisions in general you have to overlay to compare to this, and then they then find interesting things. And finally, I'm always young, John, uh, I just have a note on, on these azimuthal correlations. If you look at the rightmost figure here, this is what you find when you do two. So just um, leaving it at this as an introduction and, and starting again tomorrow with the with the rich slide. Yeah. Yep. I think that's okay. a good idea. Thank you very much. So it let me check. I did not see any questions so far or any hands raised. Um, I should have said this before the lecture that you can raise your hands if you have questions in the lecture. But now there's also a chance to ask questions about the lecture today if you have any already I see Jay is unmuted did you want to ask a question Jay did you we don't hear you until you're talking but I see another hand raised so let me uh, let's assume that Jay is only accidentally. Okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Then, yes, Carolina, we can hear you. Okay. Go ahead. Thank you. I uh, actually have a question about the, how is being a model the nucleus geometry. It's a, how is the impact parameter chosen or and or is uh, has some connection. Uh, with the nucleus density that you mentioned, I think, uh, at the beginning? Yeah, so so this is what I will talk about more. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> this was just a general introduction to, to, to the whole area of, of uh, heavy ion uh, physics. Okay, so yeah, it can be awesome if uh, 
if you can like explain the because I know I think that it's a uh, Glover. It's uh, PTI is you are using a Glover in the Glover method. Yeah, everybody is using a Glover. <laughs> so it would be uh, nice if you have. I, I, I will go through that. Okay, thank you very much. Now, Leif, I was already saying why you were dropped out uh, for a minute that there's also a lecture on more the experimental side of heavy ions in parallel, but that you will talk about the event generation aspects of heavy ion simulation. And of course, uh, one of the tutorials today and on Wednesday will be uh, actually generating heavy ion collisions in, in PITIA. Mm -hmm. All right, any further immediate questions for Leif? I don't see any, so I think we can take a break here. Thanks, Leif, for this first part of your lecture series. Thank and you. We'll see you again tomorrow morning or, and, and or in the uh, tutorial in the afternoon. And then we'll take uh, a break. Maybe let's, uh, I think it'll be fine if we reconvene at half past 11 at the planned time, even if the break is a little bit shorter. Probably still enough time to get a coffee. All right, see you in half an hour or 20 minutes.